Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Our guest today is Neil Chilson. He's a senior research fellow for technology and innovation at the Charles Koch Institute. And prior to joining CKI, he was the Federal Trade Commission's chief technologist. Welcome to the show, Neil. Great to be here. Why are we suddenly seeing so much of a backlash against big tech? Well, um, I think there's a bunch of different reasons, but I I think the most fundamental one is that uh, internet technologies have really increased uh, the legibility of the world around us. Uh, they've increased the ability to see what people are doing in more and more aspects of their lives. And uh, this is a very powerful tool, but it also raises a lot of concerns because it changes a lot of things. You use the word legibility, uh, which is not your coinage. So so why did you use that word? Yeah. So legibility is a, is a word that I, um, I think I, borrowed the usage from James C. Scott, who wrote a book uh, in 1998 called Seen Like a State, which is a case study of um, grand government plans to change uh, and improve society and how they often went wrong. Um, and he does a lot of historical case studies, uh, uh, some are, which are sort of small in scale um, in effect, and some of which are enormous and had hugely tragic con- consequences. Um, His term legibility, as he uses it, he's talking about uh, the need for a government who's going to embark on ambitious plans to understand the territory that it's regulating. So it has a purpose for for doing something, and it needs to gather data about that purpose. Um, And legibility is the word uh, that James C. Scott uses uh, to talk about how government, uh, when government increases the information that it collects, um, it makes that system more legible. And there's lots of examples I can, I can get into many ones, but the, the, I would say the main thing that he emphasizes, one of the main things he emphasizes is that legibility is directed towards a single purpose. And so it tends to ignore every other type of information in the system that isn't dedicated to that purpose. So if you're trying to do a census, um, and this was a historic problem. You're trying to do a census and people don't have last names. Uh, if you're trying to do a countrywide census, um, you might have to force people to, to choose a last name and that imposes some legibility and it ignores many other things. Uh, and it's also was unnecessary in the small town necessarily to have uh, a last name because people knew who you were. So, uh, there's, that's just one small example. Uh, of legibility and what James C. Scott means about it. One of my one of my favorite examples he gives uh, is the local knowledge of. So if you live in a if you grew up in Jonesville and the next town over is Smithburg, the road that goes from Jonesville to Smithburg in Jonesville is called the Smithburg Road, and in Smithburg is called the Jonesville Road, uh, which does not suit the purposes of a state that has, as you pointed out, some goal in mind. Uh, like to make it County Road 151 or something, which probably has to do with property, delineating property, and then figure out how to tax it. Uh, but it's there's, there's a lot of examples about this where certain things used to be, you know, you used to measure uh, rope by the distance between your thumb and your elbow. You used to measure what a bushel was and all these kind of debates, and it was functional on a local level, but states have different purposes in mind, correct? Yeah, I love that example. And, I, I, you know, the, the key thing about that is that if you're trying to make a map that's generally usable to people outside of those towns, you have to pick one of those names or maybe a different name. But it's actually more useful if you're in those towns and you're and you know the road, it's actually more useful to have the, the simple name about the destination of that road. And so you can see that legibility can be very subjective. That that label was uh, completely understandable to the people who uh, lived in those towns. Um, but didn't serve the purpose uh, that would be needed by a general map maker. It seems like there are maybe two ways to think about making legible. And I wonder if both apply or if one plays a larger role in this. The first is what we just described, which is you have a piece of information that exists about this road, and but namely what it's called, and it's public knowledge, but it's not very clear because it's in this case the road has two different names and so you pick a third name and so there isn't really more information available to the government it's just the information that was is less confusing 
Uh, and this would be kind of like making legible in the sense of I pick up a book that's in Russian and I can't read Russian, so I learn Russian and read it. But it also seems like there's potentially a making us legible in the way of accessing more information about us that wasn't that wasn't available or wasn't widely available. And this would be like, you know, learning more about me, not just understanding what I already put out there. Is there a distinction there? And do the, those play a role? Uh, I do think there is a distinction. Um, you know, you can think of this as, uh, you could split this up lots of different ways, but but one way would be, uh, you know, the example, one of the examples I use in, in my paper is the microscope, um, which opened up a whole world of information that people had never seen before, even though physically it was there, right? That information was there. Um, uh, it was available. The signals that were coming off of, you know, microscopic cells uh, of light, they existed prior to the microscope, but the microscope allowed us to see those. And I, I might call those disco that discovered legibility. And then the other type, the, the, the type that has to do with maybe with roads would be imposed legibility. So you're putting a label on something or you're simplifying something into a box, you're categorizing it. And in order to understand it better for a particular purpose, and I would call that imposed legibility. And I think both of them are, are pretty related and they can overlap. Um, Scott's book emphasizes imposed legibility because he's talking about what governments do when they're trying to pr pursue different purposes. But his book has a, a, a flavor of d describing dis uh, discovered legibility as well. Um, part of what he calls high modernism, which is this mo relatively modern idea that governments should do much more than just collect taxes and protect from invaders and stop rebellions, which is what government did for most of history. Uh, this idea that government's job is to make society better uh, led into this idea in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s of high modernism. And that was a direct result of the great successes in science. Um, people took the scientific model of discovered legibility and they said, hey, maybe we can do this for society as well. Maybe we can understand the underlying physics of the world and, and design uh, solutions that will work in a, a sort of scientific way. Now, Scott is pretty critical of this approach as, a, as, a, as uh, am I. Um, and he points out that it's not a scientific approach. It just uses the language of science, uh, that it is in many ways a very strong belief uh, that we need to remake the world and that we can, that we have the capability to understand enough about these complex systems to to redesign them from scratch and make, make them better. And as Scott points out over and over, that had really terrible consequences. Now your your paper is called seeing platforms like a state uh, in terms of internet platforms, and it struck me as I was rereading parts of seeing like a state this morning, and and he in the very beginning he writes that the main reason he went toward this way of thinking was him studying the way that governments all over the world and human history have had a huge problem with itinerant people. Gypsies, for example, like people who just don't settle down or keep moving and it just sort of frustrates them. And that's how we got thinking about this. And it seems to me if you're applying this to platforms broadly construed, there's a kind of an analogy there of like what's frustrating people on platforms, like what's making them, it's these people who are, you know, not legible in a proper way. Maybe they're anonymous or something like this. Um, so is that what, is there something that struck you about platforms that first made you start thinking to apply James C. Scott's work to this? Well, uh, I think a lot of it grew out of my work on privacy and, uh, you know, there, the thing that the internet has done has made the disparity between those two things so much greater. So what I mean is, um, on the internet, you can, be extremely legible, or at least your activities are extremely legible by design in the system to the other commu computers that you're interacting with. So all the bits that are flowing out of my computer to your guys' computers right now, your computers can see those, right? And there's no new discovery that needs to happen. Um, but so if you impose uh, an, an on, anonymous 
communications on top of that very legible system, the, the disparity is really distinct, right? And so in the in the normal world, we have lots of places where you're you're not really anonymous, but you sort of are. Like you're walking around in a public square and people don't know who you are. And uh, and so you're sort of anonymous. Um, but if for some reason people need to know who you are, or if you're like, you know, walking through the middle street or you get hit by a car or something and people need to figure out who you are, they can. Um, and so that blend is really different in the real world or in the offline world than it is in the online world. And I think that's what makes people uncomfortable. So you can have situations in which people didn't realize how legible their communications were. And then on the flip, you can have people who are extremely anonymous in a way that's not really achievable in the offline world uh, as well. And so that much bigger range, I think, makes people really uncomfortable because the analogs to, to uh, real life are not uh, you know, they're not that strong. We don't, we don't know how to do that. We've been dealing with privacy in the offline world for forever. We, we wear clothes for a very particular reason that has to do with covering up parts of us. And that's much harder to do online in, in many ways. Um, and when you do it though, you can cover yourself up completely. So I just think we don't have good mental models for that yet. And, and society hasn't really totally grasped the full implications of that. And so that's, I think that's, that's driving a lot of the concern. The government has obviously a clear incentive to make its citizens and non-citizens legible because it wants to be able to tax us, it wants to be able to regulate, and so on. What's the incentive of the platforms to try to make us more legible than just whatever we say choose to post on them? Well, there's a bunch of different ones. I mean, part of it is this: it's just, like I said, the legibility is built into the underlying technology. So... The packets are there. Um, you can build applications on top of it that might just, you know, hide some of the what, the location of the packets or where they came from or, or the identity. But it's an extremely legible environment, so there doesn't even need to be that uh, that motivation to make it more legible. Now, I think what the platforms are using this for varies quite a lot. Often they're trying to serve content that it is interesting and engaging to their users. And to do that, they need to know they're, they're paying attention to what you liked and, and engaged with in the past. So that's a big one. Um, advertising, part of the value of many of these platforms is that they connect uh, consumers with products that nominally the consumers would be interested in. That, to do that, you need to know something about what the consumers are interested in. And so they have that incentive as well. Uh, those are two probably of the, the strongest motivating ones for the types of social media networks that we're talking about. There might be lots of other reasons that you might want to do that if you're trying to prevent spam or hacking or um, if you're just trying to have a more secure environment. You might want to understand and observe patterns online. If you're just trying to design a system that's effective, that, that doesn't buffer too much, that serves people efficiently, you might want to understand how information is flowing. So there's lots of reasons to try to understand it. Uh, but the big platforms, I think, um, the ones that most concern people are the ones that are around collection about people's information specifically. So what's the, if the, if you're making a positive point that James C. E. Scott's work, you know, has some interesting applications to internet platforms and this debate of ongoing debate about this, what is the normative, uh, what do we get normatively out of if we see platforms like a state? Well, I think there's at least two lessons. The first is that, um, you know, Scott talks about the, the problems with imposing legibility or imposing uh, visibility on, on complex systems. And it's pretty clear that because they involve the interactions of millions and millions, uh, billions of people, these platforms are complex systems. Um, that has lessons both for governments who want to regulate these platforms, but it also has some pretty strong lessons, I think, for uh, the companies themselves who are trying to figure out how to manage the platforms and serve customers while also complying with local laws and, and dealing with political pressures and all of this. And so I think the big normative takeaways are, you know, James C. Scott has sort of four lessons about, he has four lessons about legibility. Um, he, he characterizes them as essentially the four conditions under which things can go really horribly, but you can, you can negate this, the statements and come up with four tactics you might use in order to keep things from going horribly when you're trying to do something. And uh, 
those are, you know, um, reduce simplistic legibility, try not to oversimplify things, uh, or, you know, or don't, don't use legibility imposing mechanisms. Uh, the second is to temper these big grand schemes, do, do incremental changes rather than trying to erase all of history and redo something. Um, you can also, I think, uh, reduce the power of the central authority to impose legibility. And then the fourth is to empower the citizens or the, the participants in the system to push back, uh, to have feedback mechanisms of some kind. And I think all of those are tools that uh, platforms as well as the governments who are regulating them could, could look to. Those are methods that the companies and the, uh, and the governments could look to to reduce some of the harms that might come from imposing legibility in an online space. As I was reading your paper, I was struck by you talk a fair amount about how people are worried or angry or fearful about increasing legibility in when it comes to online platforms. And by that, we mean mostly, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Google, so on. Um, but obviously this, this metaphor began with an assessment of the state and the state has strong interests to make us legible. And it's, it's odd that we have this bipartisan seeming consensus about the problems of legibility when it comes to Facebook learning a ton about me in order to show me not necessarily more relevant, but more engaging posts and to also put ads in front of me. But you don't see this same sort of uproar, except for, you know, weird civil libertarian corners about the government doing precisely the same thing. And in fact, doing it with, you know, a lot of the same technologies that, that these guys are using. Like it, and, and it strikes me as obvious that the government making us legible is far more of a threat and creates far more harms than Amazon or Google making me legible. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, obviously, governments, the penalties that they can impose on you and the constraints that are on them, especially I mean, even setting aside the U.S., where we do have some some constitutional constraints on what government can do to individuals, but if you go to someplace else that's more authoritarian, you can. I think that the the starkness of the divide between you know Facebook showing me an ad I don't like, or uh, you know the even the misinformation concerns and the privacy concerns compared to you know the government using a platform or information collection techniques in order to censor political speech or to suppress um, dissident ideas. I mean, the threats there are are, are much bigger, uh, much bigger scale. And one of the concerns I think that people often raise is if we make it easy or even desirable for platforms, uh, technological platforms to implement political uh, pressures or to bend to political pressures in the U S which they're facing that from both the right and the left here in the U S um, what are we telling other countries about how much their governments should force who may not have the same concerns with individual Liberty that we have. Uh, we may be giving them a justification if we in the U S are saying, Hey, government should force these platforms to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you can just see the huge danger of putting these types of surveillance tools in the in the back pockets of authoritarian regimes. And I really worry about that. It's interesting that we're recording this a day after the breaking news about the NGO group, a Israeli basically malware company that sells software that you can get onto people's phones and then monitor everything that they're doing on them and how, I mean, these dangers we talk about, like it's what, 50,000 phone numbers were released of who we think were targets of this. And it's a lot of journalists and activists in other countries who, in many cases, were assassinated within days of having the software installed on their phones. Um, and I, that seems too like another reason to potentially worry about these platforms making us legible is that we don't necessarily voluntarily set out to give all of the information about ourselves to the government. You know, like we'll we'll fill out the bare minimum of DMV forms, but we're not excited to. 
but we happily give an extraordinary amount of information to Google and Facebook. And then if that stuff becomes, or we put it all on our phones, which is owned by Google or Apple, you know, and if that stuff becomes legible, either because Apple, you know, gets subpoenaed or because the NGO group puts malware on there, then that's a huge pot of new information that the state would have had a harder time into t- in talking us into giving away. Yeah, I think technology has been trending in that direction for a long time at this point. I mean, the ability of law enforcement to require cell phone companies to give records uh, about where somebody has been, uh, you know, that's a that's a goldmine for law enforcement. And uh, in a way that has shifted the balance quite far towards uh, tracking. And it's why I'm always, uh, when I hear people on you know, advocating that that government needs more access to encrypted uh, protocols, uh, et cetera. I I wonder, I I feel like they don't acknowledge the quite significant shift uh, that has given government surveillance more power uh, over time. I do think it's really important to recognize the, the power of these tools in the commercial setting and in, uh, you know, uh, communication setting to human prosperity. I do think they have done a lot, but the power of them is part of the reason why how government uses them needs to come under very particular scrutiny. Um, The constraints that are on Google or Facebook or, you know, the hundreds of thousands of other companies that are online collecting information about what their users do are you know the types of constraints that are on market actors uh not only are they the local laws already but you can just see the the public campaigns against some of these various uses the feedback that happens when something goes wrong and often that feedback is um ginning up support on the very platforms that people are criticizing and so uh they have constraints in a way that a uh, law enforcement enforcement agency that may never even make public the information that it's using does not. And so especially something like, and we don't have to get into Fourth Amendment law at all, but something like the third party doctrine that lets the government get easier access to information that I've shared with a third party just seems extremely obsolete at this point and has really shifted the balance um, towards government uses of this data, almost subsidizing it in a sense, in a way that uh, I think is really concerning for uh, citizen privacy. Is there any, so back to Scott's book, he has a lot of examples. Um, some he focuses more on of, of what happens when the government comes in to pursue legibility and what fails when that happens. And so you kind of mentioned some of the, the normative points that he makes. And as I was reading your essay, I was trying to you know make some sort of like, is, is Reddit, analogous to a town or something, you know, so is, is the analogy here that there's some town with a bunch of informal, but traditional property rights and some government comes in and wants to tax the property uh, and therefore it's to know where it is. So it starts imposing rules onto the people in order to figure out what's going on for its purposes. As we said, it's directed toward a singular purpose usually. And all these problems develop. And like, is, is that kind of what you're talking about? If we think of Reddit, that Reddit is like a town or maybe a subreddit or maybe it's, maybe Reddit's a bad example and, uh, or something you would prefer. And that, and that if the government came in or even Reddit came in and started trying to mess with things, this is where we should be thinking about this analogy in these, in these, these kind of hypothetical situations. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's exactly right. I think, um, Reddit is a really interesting example. And, I'll just do the sort of compare and contrast between something like Reddit and Facebook as far as how they deal with some of these challenges. So Reddit, in some ways, I would consider to be like a lot of little small towns, right? Um, Subreddits have communities where they can, they set their own moderation rules and you have local consensus building mechanisms about who, what the, what the group is for, uh, what kind of conversations can go on in there. And I know we focus a lot on misinformation and other things, but it doesn't even have to be issues like that. It could be just people in a knitting subreddit saying, hey, we, we talk about knitting here. We don't talk about other things. Uh, and that makes the group more useful to people who are interested in knitting in a way that uh, if you just had every group being like a free-for-all, it wouldn't be nearly as useful uh, for people. So 
So those types of social norms that can pop up, I think what's pretty clear if you spend any time exploring across the different Reddit uh, subreddits, and I think that Reddit has grappled with this in a way that is much more nuanced in some ways than some of the, the bigger platforms, um, that one size fits rule fits all rules just don't work. Uh, the communities are so radically different. Something that would be extremely offensive, you know, in one context uh, to one group might be understood in a completely different frame or would be more relevant and less irrelevant than it would be in another group. And so I think Reddit has been, Reddit is sort of at the, is a model of a decentralized governance platform, governance system in a way that tries to deal with these problems in a way that, you know, the, just the general feed on Facebook or the general Twitter feed is not when you, that's a community of all of everybody all at once. And, um, it is Twitter is trying to impose one set of rules across that entire community. For example, now, Facebook, something like Facebook groups, you know, obviously they have some, they have some mixed version of those two things, uh, but they, they're not quite as nuanced, I think, or there's not quite as many different types of regulatory approaches. I think the tools that Facebook provides moderators are just more limited than they are on uh, Reddit, for example. And so I, I think some of the biggest platforms could learn a lot from trying to push decision-making down further um, to the communities. And I know some of them are thinking about that in ways that are even uh, more aggressive than what Reddit might do. So I, I know Mark Zuckerberg had talked, for example, about shifting uh, a lot of the business model to encrypted group communications, you know, things like uh, the Facebook Messenger or some of the, the WeChats type models where you have groups that are not visible to the outside world and in many cases not even visible to the platforms because they're encrypted direct uh, between the users. That is a, that's one of the examples there is in the paper of a sort of imposed illegibility that might relieve the companies of the responsibility, uh, or I should say the political pressure to, to try to do something about what people are communicating online. They can say, Hey, we just can't access this. So quit asking us for it. Um, that might be one way that they look to do that, but I think. I think they're running into lots of different barriers there as well. Yeah, but is that going to get what people want out of what people want out of Facebook? And that kind of seems to be like a meta point to your argument, where you have to look at what the what the goal is. Because some people want Facebook to crack down on misinformation and make sure that uh, it's it's playing in the political game in some sort of neutral arbiter kind of way. And some people don't want that at all. And so, does that mean that they would both pursue entirely different? sort of like each of those different opinions would pursue a different type of legibility or maybe illegibility if they're trying for like what they're doing. And Reddit has a completely different goal, like not even, you know, related to any of these other goals. So we have to look at the goal to understand the legibility and then the problems that could arise from the different goals that are being imposed or discussed for these platforms. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think um, you can see this, I think, in the fights over content moderation what everybody wants, you know, people often say, well, just go find you, just go build your own platform. But, but what people want is not just, they don't just want a platform that has their ideas out on it. They want a platform that has everybody on it so they can have the biggest audience possible. And so those two goals are in sort of direct conflict. If you're going to have a broad range of ideas on a platform, you're going to have to have a broad range of people. And if you want a broad audience, you're very likely to be bringing in a broad range of uh, ideas. And so, I think those those two purposes are in tension where people are trying to get the benefits of having a enormous platform platform for them to speak on, but also want to impose some controls on what other people can say on it. Um, these are fights that are really old, actually, in in media technology. They go way before social media, um, all the way back to you know the printing press. When you have new ways that people can communicate. Um, it is very disruptive and people, politicians and people who want to shape society have long realized that being able to uh, influence those conduits for, for thought and communication is a key way to um, 
control society or to affect society at least. And James C. Scott doesn't talk a ton about those types of media controls in there. Um, many of the impositions that he has are, are actually much more physical architecture, things like building constructed towns like Brasilia um, and very dramatic for that very reason. But I think the same, many of the same principles apply to trying to control information. I, I'm stuck to our old colleague, Adam Bates has remarked too on that. Like it's, I don't think it's just that they want a big audience, but like the trolls want to be where the non trolls are where, so this shows up with like every time a kind of Trumpist social media thing starts up, it, peters out because the Trumpists don't want to be where Trumpists are, even if it's a huge audience. They want to be where the libs are so that they can upset the libs with what they're saying. Um, and I think that's a, a really strong dynamic is it's not even it's it's the interaction too. Um, I I wonder if there's a like we have seen the internet began as basically a series of open protocols. So it's TCP IP that the information's going over, but then things built on top of that, whether it's, you know, email protocol or whatever. These are just open protocols. And then usage popped up in the form of these small towns of, you know, you had like your your Usenet provider and they gave you access to certain Usenet groups and might have certain rules and so on. And there was a lot of ad hoc common law rule formation in these places. And then we moved, you know, AOL didn't win, but the AOL model seems to have won out of now we just, the internet is a handful of very large platforms that all of the data flows through and we use them. Is this, you know, and it, and that mirrors kind of the this argument about federalism versus centralization in government and you know, that like libertarians pushing for getting back to less centralization, more on the ground, whether it's Hayekian information or local knowledge, lawmaking and so on. Is that the path then that we should potentially be looking to take is kind of turning the Internet back into just a series of protocols that people can interact on as they see fit? So the internet has uh, has moved through sort of waves in this. As you pointed out, AOL was very much a walled garden, but even before AOL, CompuServe and Prodigy were walled gardens that brought lots of people on um, online because they were safe, they were limited, they were easy to use. There was an incentive in that. Before that, like using a Usenet uh, group was not super intuitive, especially setting one up. Uh, it took so, and it was like mostly used by pretty nerdy people um, who tended to be the main people who are online. And that's that's true for a bunch of other communications technologies early on. Things like CompuServe and Prodigy simplified that, brought it to a mass, or, mass audience. AOL did that. But then the web blew that up sort of, right? Like, so websites, once you anybody could put a website up, that decentralized this a lot. And, and now we still have that parallel web architecture um, where anybody can really set up a website uh, for almost, for zero cost today. Um, but then we have these, as you said, these big gateways, which are extremely useful because they have these network effects. Lots of people are on them. Um, you can get an audience very quickly. And so those, like I said, those things come in waves. And I think what we've seen is that we'll, we'll continue to see that for certain types of uses, these platforms will be very popular. I think what we're seeing is that the challenges that they face when they become extremely popular and they become um, influential in the, I, I don't mean the platforms themselves, but people are able to influence ideas and influence dialogue through them. So there have been proposals to move how these, con how these platforms, um, for example, select what content shows up in your feed to move that to a protocol approach rather than a single algorithm that the company provides. And when I say single algorithm, that's dramatically oversimplifying it. Uh, you, you can't really think of machine learning as a single algorithm in many ways. It's a bunch of custom algorithms for lots of different people. But a protocol approach, I think Mike Masnick has written on this and and I know Jack Dorsey has 
talked about it and I think even set up a project to do something like that with Twitter. I don't know where that's gone or how, how far it's been pursued. But people are looking at that for the very limited purpose of the, the Facebook feed or the Twitter feed, for example. I don't think that solves all the problems. I mean, it certainly doesn't change the um, the misinformation concerns, I don't think, really. I mean, what it, all it would do would be sort of hide. <laughs> It'd let, it might let people pick the bubbles that they want much more effectively, um, which I think uh, could be a plus or minus, right? Uh, it, it could make it a more comfortable environment for, for people, but sometimes being uncomfortable is a big part of the value of engaging with other people. Um, so I, I do think there are trade-offs there. And I expect that they there will be innovation in that direction. You're already seeing platforms who are trying to do something like this. And I, I think there was just a – read an article uh, about a gentleman who is trying to build a uh, a protocol stack that is blockchain-based, essentially, to do something similar where you could move your – your social network. So you, the, my, all my connections on Facebook, I might be able to move them from one place to another, or I'd have them you know, stored on the blockchain. I think it raises a bunch of concerns. It's, it's, a, it's not, a, again, there's trade-offs there, but I think there is a lot of experiment, experimenting in that space. And I think we can expect to continue to see that. Uh, and that's a good thing. And it, I think we could see the wave away from more centralized platforms and back towards decentralized uh, use, use cases that we've seen in the past in internet history from new technologies. They unveiled last year the Facebook Oversight Board, uh, which is still trying to figure out precisely what this thing might be doing. Our, our colleague, John Samples, is, is on that board. Um, and then you also write in the paper about case-by-case -case versus standards in terms of adjudication. And you seem to prefer case-by-case -case in some ways. Um, so first, can you explain that sort of distinction and the virtues of each? And then is the Facebook Oversight Board, you think, are they, is that trying for a case by case kind of system rather than a standard system? Yeah. So, uh, the distinction that I draw between case by case and standards is, is largely based on my experience having spent a lot of time doing telecommunications law with the FCC and then having spent time at the FTC. And these are really different organizations. Uh, the FTC is an enforcement agency that looks at specific facts and applies uh, very general principles of unfairness and unfair methods of competition and deception uh, to those facts to decide whether or not a company has broken the law. Whereas the FCC writes industry-wide rules that, are, uh, that govern how people will act going forward. Um, I think... And I've written about this in some other places, including a, a book I have coming out in September uh, that includes some of these ideas from this paper. I think the big difference is the the knowledge problem, the Hayekian knowledge problem uh, between those two systems, especially for complex systems, gathering enough information to let you anticipate a, a one-size-fits-all answer for an, a, a wide industry is very challenging. Whereas if you have general principles such as don't be deceptive and you work those out through common law-like case-by-case approaches, um, the knowledge problem is reduced quite a lot because you're looking at a very specific set of facts in front of you um, and you're trying to apply those. And you're also looking at what the specific harms are rather than trying to hypothesize what harms your regulatory regime might be trying to stop ahead of time. So it's not to say that rules, I mean, rules are important, I think, especially the, but often they are derived, even, even when we have um, broad-based rules that we pass, they're, they're often derived from best practices that industry or that uh, individuals uh, have, have learned about in the past. And so um, in the privacy space, I think there's, there's, you know, notice and consent is one of the best practices that's been going on for a long time uh, and is also embodied often in quite a lot of different laws. And so I, I think the trade-offs are, are there, you know, the one thing that's nice about prescriptive legislation is you can give some certainty, at least in the short run, uh, to businesses or to consumers about what's going to happen in the space. 
it doesn't work so well in fast moving technological spaces because you can write one set of rules and then the technology changes and those rules are can be very confusing to figure out how they they apply to that that new technology um but and also you can try to anticipate harms ahead of time before they happen one of the big criticisms of case by case is that you have to wait till something bad happens and then you have to bring a case um that can be overstated a little bit because obviously precedent does have a constraining effect on how companies and individuals act in the future. Um, once a once a court says, "Hey, this type of practice is kind of out of bounds," then presumably the liability risk goes up to a company if they don't uh, pay attention to that. So that's that's sort of what what I mean by the case by case versus rule based approach. The Facebook Oversight Board is, in some ways, doing that. Now, again, this is not a it's not a government entity. So the, and Facebook is doing this voluntarily. The, the oversight board is separate from Facebook, but you know, Facebook is saying, Hey, we're going to submit things. We're going to, here's our promises about how we're going to treat this organization and what we're going to do with the information they give. But ultimately the Facebook oversight board can't force Facebook to do anything. Uh, what they are doing is I think digging in deep, you can, uh, into various specific situations as a way to educate both Facebook and the broader uh, community about what the challenges are in any one particular decision as a way to learn for Facebook about how they might do things better in the future. Um, so it does look a little bit like case by case even though it's not precedent setting in the same way that a court case by case decision might be. Facebook has well over a billion users. Um, and I think that's active users. So people who are logging in daily or on a regular basis, which is a lot more than exists in the United States or Europe or wherever else. Like this is, it's international. And that internationalness is. One of the huge benefits of these platforms on Twitter, I can talk to people in, you know, India or Albania or wherever. Um, but that would seem to cause problems for both legibility and either case by case or rulemaking in that on the legibility side, it's these platforms, what they're trying to govern is interactions between people. And there's legal implications to that, but there's also social implications to that because their business is getting people to use the site and want to use it and want to come back. And so it has to be socially satisfying to them. But that kind of stuff varies tremendously across countries and cultures. And so what is acceptable in the United States is not acceptable in Saudi Arabia from both a legal standpoint and like a social, you know, morality standpoint, um, just more like mores, I suppose. Um, and, and so even if you like learn what those things are, it doesn't necessarily help you solve this like meta problem. Um, and then on the case by case, it seems like a billion users posting who knows how many billion posts every day means that case by case is just simply impossible on all cases, you have to pick and choose. And you know, the Facebook board took months to make a decision on a single case in the Trump instance. So it doesn't, it doesn't like scale to the size of the platforms and you can have, you know, multiple competing interests in the form of India says you can't criticize the regime in the government in the US. That's like our like God given duty. Um, and, and so how do you, how do you deal with it's I mean, it's one thing when like a state is trying to regulate the people within its geographical territory and it can just do this top down, but top down doesn't seem to make sense on a global level. Yeah, it I, I it really doesn't. Um there are this is a problem and an opportunity, I would say, in some ways. Um obviously when you have competing ideas about like like you pointed out. Um, India doesn't want to criticize the regime, but uh, maybe a, a, a more classic example is, you know, Germany bans posting of Nazi memorabilia, uh, even on like to sell or to collect or even to criticize often. <laughs> um, and so, uh, and those types of restrictions, I think can be, 
uh, hard to figure out how you might apply them across many different communities. Um, and that's why a decentralized approach does make a ton of sense. Part One of the big problems for these platforms is they could have hundreds of thousands of users in a place where they don't even have a single content moderator who knows the language, right? Or even if they know the language, they don't know all of the social context to know when something is satire and when something isn't. And so the more you try to centralize that, you know, Facebook has something like 30,000 content moderators. And it's clearly, like to your second point, not even close to enough, enough to be scalable, to, to encounter, there's, you're always going to have tons of content that is under enforced, right, by their, their community rules, uh, as, as determined by their community rules. And you're always going to have tons of mistakes that are made just because the volume is so high. Uh, part of that, I think, is one of the lessons from seeing like a state is that this is just a situation and the only scalable response is, is something that is highly decentralized. Um, and social norms are things that are like that. Now, I said there was an opportunity here as well. One of the opportunities is, to, is that platforms like Facebook that have a global reach could help export some of our pluralistic norms to other countries. Uh, there, is, there is the opportunity to do that. And uh, I think that largely when you see these platforms pushing back against censorship from the government in other er in other regimes, they're trying to do something like that. Uh, I don't think they get very much cover for that here in the U.S. And in fact, I think a lot of the attacks that have been um, placed on some of these companies, I think, help the, those totalitarian regimes um, point to examples about, about how, like, how the U.S. isn't stick, standing up to you know its own standards in some of this uh, area. So, I do think there is an opportunity to to build more to, um, tolerance and pluralism on, online. I don't think it's one that the companies have pursued very thoroughly. Uh, it's one that I think is challenging. Um, and, but I think the only answers are going to be decentralized approaches to this. I mean, I, I think that's what's happening now. We just don't think of it that way. Um, and, because it's not Facebook making the decisions, you know, a good chunk of the censorship on Twitter is like when people block somebody else or where you just stop engaging with somebody, you don't follow them. Um, these are the types of uh, billions and billions of decisions that are being made every day that are changing the media environment online for each individual and, and overall, but they're not centralized. And I think we only notice the ones that are centralized and those are the ones that raise the biggest problems as you pointed out. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.